Hello, like, comment, share. I would greatly appreciate that. Today I'm going to talk to you about Seder, an Old Norse shamanistic custom. Uh, Seder, meaning cord, string, or snare, is a form of pre-Christian Norse magic and shamanism concerned with discerning the course of fate and working within its structure to bring about change, which was done by symbolically weaving new events into being. To do this, the practitioner with the ritual distaff in hand entered into an ecstatic trance in order to be able to interact with the world of spirit. The practitioner's intended task typically involved a prophecy, a blessing, or a curse. Archaeologist Neil Price has provided an excellent summary of the known uses of Seder. There were Seder rituals for divination and clairvoyance, for seeking out the hidden, both in the secrets of the mind and in physical locations, for healing the sick, for bringing good luck, for controlling the weather, for calling game animals and fish. Importantly, it could also be used for the opposite of these things, to curse an individual or an enterprise, to blight the land and make it barren, to induce illness, to tell false futures, and thus to set their recipients on a road to disaster to injure, maim, and kill in domestic disputes and especially in battle. In other accounts in the sources, they were described to practice from an elevated platform, notably Eric the Red Saga. And while we are unsure of the height of these platforms, in one account, two vulva practicing Sather fall from the platform during their ecstatic dance and both break their backs. So it must have been somewhat high. Elevated plat platforms and say they're dancing. Picture this, a vulva purchased, perched on a special elevated platform surrounded by a group of young women. It's like a mystical tea party, but with more cosmic implications. The platform wasn't just for show, it was essential for her craft. On this elevated stage, she would perform Seder. So there she stood, staff in hand, ready to weave her spells and peer into the threads of fate. The Norns seem to be the foremost masters of Seder, since they use weaving to establish the fate of all beings. Surely an allusion to the techniques of Seder given the highly magical task to which they put those techniques. Perhaps because of this connection, a practitioner of magic was sometimes called a Norn, Old Norse for witch, with a lowercase n. Two of the Asir and Vanir deities are noted masters of Seder, the goddess Freya and the god Odin, both Freya and Odin in turn can be seen as the divine models of Seder practitioners among their respective genders. Seder was a highly gendered activity during the Viking Age, so this distinction is of prime importance. Freya is the archetype of the vulva, a professional or semi-professional practitioner of Seder. It was she who first brought this art to the gods. The vulva wandered from town to town and farm to farm, perform performing commissioned acts of magic in exchange for room, board, and often other forms of compensation as well. The most detailed account of such a woman and her craft comes from the saga of Eric the Red, but numerous sagas, as well as some of the heroic poems, most not notably the Voluspa, the insight of the vulva, contain sparse accounts of Seder workers and their practices. 
Like other northern Eurasian shama, shamans, the vulva was set apart from her wider society, both in a positive and negative sense. She was simultaneously exalted, sought after, feared, and in some instances reviled. However, the vulva is very reminiscent of the Veleda, the seeress or prophetess who held a more clearly defined and highly respected position amongst the Germanic tribes of the first several centuries CE. The Veleda was also modeled on a goddess who, over the course of the centuries, became Freya. In either of these roles, the woman practitioner of these arts held a more or less dignified role among her people, even as the degree of her dignity varied considerably over time. On the other hand, the sources are clear that according to the societal norms of the Viking Age, say that it wasn't a fitting activity for men, to say the least. According to traditional Germanic gender constructs, it was extremely shameful and dishonorable for a man to adopt a female social or sexual role. A man who practiced seder could be expected to be labeled arger, Old Norse for unmanly. The noun form is ergi, unmanliness by his peers, one of the gravest insults that could be hurled at a Norseman. While there were probably several reasons for the Seder being considered Arga, the greatest seems to have been the centrality of weaving, the paragon of the traditional female economic sphere in Seder. Still, this didn't stop numerous men from engaging in Seder sometimes even as a profession. A few such men have had their deeds recorded in the sagas. The foremost among such scythemen was, of course, none other than Odin himself. And not even he escaped the charge of Arger. This taunt was nevertheless fraught with tense ambivalence. Unmanly as Scyther was, or may have been, seen as being, it was undeniably a source of incredible power, perhaps the greatest power in the cosmos, given that it could change the course of destiny itself. Perhaps the sacrifice of social prestige for these abilities wasn't too bad of a bargain. After all, such men could look to the very ruler of Asgard as an example and a patron. This article came from norsemythology.org uh, and if you enjoyed this please like share comment i appreciate that and i hope you have a good night